Hi, I'm Jen Potter, a CA3 resident at Stanford. In this lecture, we will discuss the causes and echo evaluation of mitral regurgitation. Before watching this lecture, you should have already watched and become comfortable with the normal valve anatomy lecture. First, let's quickly review the anatomy of the mitral valve. The image on the left shows the anatomic view of the base of the heart and the mitral valve, looking down from the atrial aspect as if we have cut off the atria and gray vessels. On the right, we see the surgeon's view, which is rotated about 45 degrees counterclockwise from the anatomic view. This image shows the anterior and posterior leaflets, the three scallops of the posterior leaflet, and the associated segments on the anterior leaflet. This picture illustrates the cross-section of the valve obtained in each of the four most common views used to evaluate the mitral valve. Remember that TEE is dynamic, and you can't always reliably tell which part of the mitral valve you're looking at solely from knowing which view you're in. For example, while in the midesophageal four-chamber view, withdrawing the probe will show you A1 and A2, while advancing the probe will show you the more posterior aspects of both the anterior and posterior leaflets. This lecture is about mitral regurgitation, which is defined as the regurgitation of blood through the mitral valve during systole. It is helpful to divide the causes of MR into two general types, primary and secondary. In primary MR, the valve makes the heart sick. It is structural damage to the valve itself that causes it to become leaky and regurgitant. Chronic regurgitation can lead to left ventricular failure and pulmonary venous hypertension. Since the initial pathology involves the valve itself, Primary MR is typically, but not always, amenable to surgical correction. In secondary MR, also known as functional MR, the heart makes the valve sick. Left ventricular failure can cause valvular regurgitation through several mechanisms. LV dilation and wall motion abnormalities can cause displacement of the papillary muscles and leaflet tethering, such that leaflets do not coapt appropriately in systole. A dilated valve annulus from a dilated failing ventricle may also worsen the coaptation defect and regurgitation. Management of secondary MR is not as straightforward and could be either medical or surgical. This slide lists the numerous causes of mitral regurgitation, subdivided by their primary or secondary etiology. Rheumatic valvular disease is the most common cause of both mitral regurgitation and stenosis in developing nations, but is much less common in the United States. Myxomatous degeneration can take several forms. The first is Barlow's disease, which is characterized by thickened, redundant valve leaflets, cortical elongation, and annular dilation. It typically presents earlier in life than fibroelastic deficiency. Fibroelastic deficiency typically involves only a single leaflet segment and often presents later in life with cortical elongation and acute rupture. Repair of Barlow's disease is typically far more challenging than that of fibroelastic deficiency. Finally, connective tissue diseases such as Marfan's, Ehlers-Danlos, osteogenesis imperfecta, pseudoxanthoma elasticum, and genetic disorders such as Turner syndrome can all have Barlow's-like mitral valve degeneration associated with mitral regurgitation. Endocarditis can be caused by bacterial, viral, or fungal pathogens. It can destroy leaflet tissue, causing leaflet perforations or valvular incompetence from vegetations, which cause coaptation defects by impairing valve closure. Mitral annular calcification can cause both mitral regurgitation and stenosis by interfering with normal leaflet motion. Rheumatologic causes of MR include lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis. Congenital heart disease, either repaired or unrepaired, can cause MR. The spectrum of endocardial cushion defects, also known as atrioventricular canal defects, are typically associated with a common AV valve and regurgitation. This will be discussed in more detail in the adult congenital lecture. Now let's explore the causes of secondary MR in a bit more detail. The pathophysiology of MR from a dilated cardiomyopathy was described earlier. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, thickened myocardium can cause systolic anterior motion, or SAM, of the anterior mitral leaflet, leading to both mitral regurgitation and left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. This pathophysiologic state is exacerbated by tachycardia and hypovolemia. SAM will be discussed in further detail in the hypotensive emergency section. Finally, left ventricular ischemia can cause secondary MR through mechanisms described earlier, as well as by a ruptured papillary muscle, 
The posterior medial papillary muscle is more susceptible to rupture due to its singular blood supply from the right coronary artery compared to the anterolateral muscle, which has dual supply from both the LAD and circumflex arteries. Let's define a couple of terms used to describe leaflet motion in mitral valve pathology. Billowing occurs when part of the valve leaflet extends into the atrium during systole, but the coaptation point is below the level of the mitral annulus. Prolapse refers to displacement of the mitral leaflet tip into the atrium such that leaflet coaptation occurs above the level of the annulus during systole. Flail refers to a leaflet edge that flows freely into the atrium during systole. Dr. Alain Carpentier is a French cardiothoracic surgeon who is often regarded as the father of modern mitral valve surgery. His classification system is the most widely used to describe mitral valve pathology. In type 1 disease, leaflet motion is normal, but problems like leaflet perforation and annular dilation cause regurgitation. Type 1 lesions typically result in a central regurgitant jet. Type 2 disease is characterized by excessive leaflet motion and includes flail, prolapse, and billowing leaflet pathology described earlier. In type 2 lesions, the regurgitant jet is typically directed away from the disease leaflet. Type 2 lesions are frequently associated with Barlow's disease and fibroelastic deficiency, but can happen in other settings as well, such as with ischemic papillary muscle rupture. Type 3 disease is characterized by restricted leaflet motion. It is subdivided into types 3A and 3B. 3A describes structural damage to the valve, typically by rheumatic disease, and involves restricted movement in both systole and diastole. 3B involves restriction in systole only and is seen in functional or ischemic MR. The regurgitant jet could either be central, as in type 3B, or directed towards the disease leaflet, as in type 3A, that only involves a single leaflet. The severity of valvular regurgitation ranges from trace, defined as a barely detectable and often normal physiologic finding, to severe, which is often hemodynamically significant. Mild to moderate and moderate to severe classification can be used in intermediate cases. Angiography is the gold standard to which echocardiographic rating is compared to. You may still hear surgeons and cardiologists refer to moderate MR as 3+. You can find a link to a table of the angiographic scoring system in the resources tab. This is the outline we will use to describe the echo evaluation of MR. First, let's look at how we use the 2D exam to evaluate MR. When evaluating the valve leaflets, pay close attention to the structure. Are they normal in appearance or is there redundant missing or damaged tissue? Are the leaflets thickened or retracted? Also evaluate the leaflet coaptation or how well the leaflets come together and seal during systole. Is the coaptation occurring at the level of the annulus above or below? The size of the annulus should also be noted. A large dilated annulus will almost always be associated with regurgitation. Look for vegetations, masses, or thrombus on the valvular apparatus that could prevent proper leaflet coaptation. Calcification will appear as a bright echogenicity either on the leaflets themselves or around the mitral annulus and will cause a shadowing in the far field. Chamber appearance and function gives an indication of the acuity and severity of mitral regurgitation. Chronic moderate and severe regurgitation is often associated with a dilated left atrium and left ventricle, and you can also see left ventricular hypertrophy. These changes are rarely seen in mild MR or acute severe MR, where there has not been sufficient time for remodeling to occur. Let's review some images to illustrate these 2D findings. This is a mid-esophageal four-chamber view showing a mitral valve with thickened leaflet tips and restricted leaflet motion characteristic of rheumatic mitral valve disease. This is an example of Carpentier's type 3A MR. When we put color flow Doppler over the valve, we see a central jet of regurgitation. Here is another example of pathologic leaflet structure and coaptation. This is a mid-esophageal four-chamber view of the heart. This patient had an inferior MI from an RCA infarct five days prior to this study. This echo was performed to evaluate profound hypotension and hypoxemia with pink froth coming from the endotracheal tube. The patient suffered a posterior medial papillary muscle rupture that led to acute severe mitral regurgitation.
Here we see the posterior medial papillary muscle flailing up into the left atrium. Once color fluid Doppler is placed over the valve, we see evidence of severe MR caused by gross valvular incompetence. This image shows a mid-esophageal four-chamber view showing a large dilated left atrium and dilated mitral valve annulus. The anterior posterior diameter of the mitral annulus is measured using calipers. A diameter less than 3.8 centimeters is normal, and this one measures almost 5 centimeters. It's dilated. This is a mid-esophageal commissural view showing a large vegetation on the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This patient had native valve endocarditis causing mitral regurgitation and subsequently underwent a mitral valve repair. This is a modified mid-esophageal four-chamber view with the probe rotated to the left and zoomed in so that we only see the left side of the heart. Notice the large left atrium and dilated, poorly contracting left ventricle. The mitral valve annulus is also dilated, leading to poor coaptation of the valve leaflets. Just looking at this image alone, we can surmise that there is likely significant mitral regurgitation present. Next, let's look at how color flow Doppler is used to evaluate MR. The first way to use color flow Doppler to evaluate mitral regurgitation is to evaluate the appearance and direction of the regurgitant jet into the receiving chamber. There isn't a great correlation between the area of the jet and severity, but generalizations can typically be made by the appearance of the MR jet. Small, central jets are in general typically mild and not hemodynamically significant. Large jets that penetrate deep into the left atrium, pulmonary veins, or wrap around the wall of the atrium are considered severe until proven otherwise. This is a mid-esophageal four-chamber view rotated to the left to show only the left atrium and left ventricle. There is a small central regurgitant jet consistent with mild MR. This is the image we saw earlier of a dilated left heart, poor LV function, and dilated mitral valve annulus. Now that we place color flow over the valve, we see that our suspicion was confirmed and that there is indeed moderate to severe MR. Here is an example of a large central jet of MR with a large jet area that penetrates deep into the left atrium. This is undoubtedly severe MR in a patient who has just come off cardiopulmonary bypass possibly due to myocardial ischemia from air entry into the right coronary artery. The Kawanda effect refers to a regurgitant jet that is directed towards the wall of the receiving chamber. A wall-hugging jet will appear smaller than it otherwise would if it were a central jet because the blood spreads out as it encounters the wall of the atrium. This should be taken into account when assessing the severity of the regurgitation and common practice is to upgrade the severity of the MR by one degree if the Kawanda effect is seen. This is a mid-esophageal long axis view of the mitral valve. We are most likely seeing A2 here and P2 here. Notice that A2 is prolapsing into the left atrium, causing an eccentric jet of regurgitation that is directed away from the disease leaflet. Regurgitation may not appear very severe at first, but notice the wall-hugging jet at the top of the screen. This is likely severe MR and is an example of Carpentier's type 2 disease. Jet area is another way we use color flow to help determine MR severity. It is performed by tracing a line around the color flow regurgitant jet and the computer software will calculate an area. Unfortunately, there is a poor correlation between jet area and MR severity. This is especially true for eccentric jets and is due to several factors. First, you can imagine that the actual size of a three-dimensional jet could easily be under or overestimated depending on where a two-dimensional slice of the jet is taken from. Also, the size of the jet will vary based on the patient's hemodynamics. A mild regurgitant jet will appear more severe in the setting of increased afterload and conversely, severe regurgitation may appear less severe in the setting of hypotension and elevated left atrial pressure. For this reason, the American Society of Echocardiography re recommends cautious use of planimetry and eyeballing of jet area in determining severity of MR. This image illustrates how you would trace the jet area. This is actually an apical four-chamber view from transthoracic echo. This is the right atrium, 
right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. This here is a jet of MR with jet area traced in red. The vena contracta refers to the narrowest part of the regurgitant jet just after it passes through the regurgitant orifice. It can be measured in any long axis plane of the mitral valve and is best obtained by using high resolution zoomed views. The advantages of this technique are that it is easy to perform and can quickly distinguish mild or severe MR. The size of the vena contracta is used to determine MR severity. Width less than three millimeters corresponds to mild MR and greater than six millimeters to severe MR. A major disadvantage of this technique is that it is unreliable in the setting of regular, eccentric, or multiple jets. The image on the right shows a still clip of the mid-esophageal four-chamber view rotated to the left to show the mitral valve. The arrow points to where we would measure the vena contracta. PISA and EROA are advanced topics that you're not likely to see on the basic exam, but they're important concepts to be aware of in general. PISA refers to proximal isovelocity surface area and relies on the principle of flow convergence. As regurgitant blood in left ventricle approaches the mitral valve, it accelerates and makes concentric hemispheres of uniform velocity. When blood reaches the aliasing velocity, or Nyquist limit, it will change from red to blue. At that location, we know both the velocity of the blood, which will equal the Nyquist limit, we always see in the top corner of the screen when we use color flow Doppler, and the radius of the hemisphere, which we can measure using calipers. This measurement is used in the continuity equation to determine the effective regurgitant orifice area, or EROA. It is important that this be measured during the peak velocity of the MR jet, as we'll see in the next slide. We use the PISA method to determine the effective regurgitant orifice area using the continuity equation, which states that A1 times V1 equals A2 times V2. This is the same principle we use to determine aortic valve area and aortic stenosis. Now that we know the surface area of the hemisphere of blood approaching the regurgitant orifice, the aliasing velocity or Nyquist limit, and the peak MR velocity from continuous wave Doppler, we then use the continuity equation to solve for the EROA. There are several limitations to the PISA method. First, the method assumes that the regurgitant orifice is round and that the PISA shells are perfect hemispheres, both of which may or may not be true. Also, the PISA method is inaccurate with multiple or eccentric jets. Note that the images to the right show this technique being used in transthoracic echo, but the same concept applies for TEE. Next, let's look at the use of pulse wave Doppler to evaluate MR. Regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction, like EROA, rely on the continuity principle. The regurgitant volume is the amount of blood that is backing up through the mitral valve during systole and is calculated by subtracting the transaortic stroke volume from the transmitral stroke volume. Stroke volume is calculated by multiplying velocity time integral, or VTI, by the cross-sectional area. The VTI is expressed as a distance and is obtained by tracing the area under the curve of a Doppler waveform of mitral and LVOT flow. This can conceptually be thought of as calculating the volume of a cylinder of blood that is crossing the mitral valve during diastole and subtracting it from the volume of a cylinder of blood that is leaving the LVOT during systole. As is true with the EROA calculation, this method is limited by the assumption that the mitral orifice is round, which it is typically not. A regurgitant volume of less than 30 milliliters is considered mild and greater than 60 milliliters is considered severe. Once the regurgitant volume is known, the regurgitant fraction can be calculated by dividing the RV by the volume of blood flowing through the mitral valve during diastole. A regurgitant fraction less than 30% indicates mild MR, and greater than 50% corresponds to severe MR. Another way to use pulse wave Doppler to assess MR is to evaluate the mitral inflow peak velocity and the relative sizes of the E and A waves. Mitral inflow is commonly used to assess diastolic function, and recall that a normal mitral inflow pattern has an E or early filling wave that is larger than the A or atrial kick wave. This is demonstrated in the image to the left. In severe MR, as is seen in the right-hand image, the E wave will be large, typically greater than 1.2 meters per second, 
but some texts say 1.5 meters per second. This is because of the extra volume of blood that must flow and integrate over the valve in diastole. If the A wave is larger than the E wave, which is seen in type 1 diastolic dysfunction termed impaired relaxation, then severe MR can be ruled out. This is a fast, reliable way to exclude severe MR but is subject to several limitations. Specifically, it is not valid in atrial fibrillation as the A wave will be absent and is heavily influenced by the left atrial pressure and the presence of diastolic dysfunction. The characteristics of pulmonary venous inflow can give an indication of the severity of mitral regurgitation. To obtain this waveform, a pulse wave gate is placed in a pulmonary vein. Normal pulmonary venous inflow is integrated in both systole and diastole with a small retrograde deflection during atrial contraction. This pattern is typically maintained in mild MR. In moderate MR, the S wave will be blunted as antegrade flow is diminished due to regurgitation. Severe MR will cause a reversal of flow in the pulmonary veins during systole. These images show different pulmonary venous flow patterns for varying degrees of MR. On the left, we see the normal systolic dominant pattern and an A reversal wave. The middle panel shows systolic blunting in moderate MR. The right panel shows systolic reversal characteristic of severe MR. Finally, let's look at how we use continuous wave Doppler to evaluate MR. The continuous wave signal is obtained by placing the sample line through the regurgitant jet. Notice that the waveform is in the opposite direction from the pulse wave assessment. Here we are measuring the regurgitant flow instead of the antegrade mitral flow. The appearance of the CW signal is useful in determining the severity of MR. The left-hand image shows the continuous wave Doppler appearance of mild MR. Notice that the continuous wave signal of mild MR is faint and parabolic with an incomplete envelope. Contrast this to the dense envelope seen on the right. In severe MR, the CW signal density will appear dense and closer to that of antegrade flow, as a greater percentage of flow is regurgitant. The timing of the signal is also important. A more triangular signal with an early peak is indicative of either elevated left atrial pressure or severe MR. Note that while it is possible to underestimate MR if the CW signal is not directly aligned through the vena contracta, it is impossible to overestimate severity using this technique. As is true for other methods of assessment, interpretation of the continuous wave signal density and contour is of limited value with eccentric jets. We just presented all of these methods for evaluating MR, but what do we actually use on a routine basis with real patients? A practical approach is to work through the evaluation in this sequence. Start with a 2D exam to help determine the mechanism and acuity of the MR. Next, place color flow over the valve to assess jet direction and morphology. Then, measure the vena contracta and assess pulmonary venous inflow. If further evaluation is needed, you could also consider measuring the PISA, EROA, regurgitant volume, and regurgitant fraction. This is a summary of all the parameters that we just discussed in this lecture for your reference. Here's a list of some great resources to learn more about MR. The first two are the European and American Society of ECHO guidelines that much of this talk was drawn from. Carpentier's and Perino's textbooks have excellent chapters in the mitral valve. Finally, there are several websites listed that have great lectures and clips of mitral valve pathology. You can find links to all of these in the resources section on our website.